Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. My name is Robert Luciani, and I'm here with my great colleague. Adol Kulmeister, it's great to have you here. Uh, this is the first we're doing ever, so what we're looking for is to get feedback, comments, and of course, more than one like. Let's dive into it. So, what's new, Rob? Well, there's an article I want to talk about a little bit called Learning in High Dimension Always Amounts to Extrapolation. And I think a lot of people read this and there's a very interesting technical element to it. Uh, and those that aren't interested in the technical element might dismiss it as a, a discussion about uh, syntax, uh, certainly not semantics, because that's exactly what it is. The question here is, what is extrapolation? Why is that important? What does that have to do with AI? So I was even going to backtrack you a little bit more because I'm not sure how, how good our, our viewers are. High dimensional and extrapolation. Maybe we should start with just defining it before jumping into the, the, the conversation because sure. I do agree it's, a, it's a, a really interesting topic. Well, one of the things I think AI is particularly good for is solving problems that have a lot of different choices to make. So if you're just trying to choose you know, how much a house costs based on the number of square meters in the house, that only gives you one dimension of choices to make. But if you have a, a thousand dimensions of choices to make, then they, these choices tend to play with each other in uh, non-trivial ways. It's not like one goes up and the other one goes up at the same time. They, they go in curves and all that kind of stuff. And we tend to talk about the shape of these choices like a landscape, like a map a little bit. And so it's not a three-dimensional map or a two-dimensional map. It's a super high-dimensional map. So for those of us uh, or those of them who took a very easy or a simple statistic, they probably just look at the y and the x-axis and then they do regression and they, they see it's a linear relationship. So basically what you're saying now is that there are more hidden dimensions to these things and we should probably look at it as a map. Uh, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And uh, specifically, where AI really shines is in relationships where the relationships are not linear. So they might be curvy, they might be, you know, non-trivially curvy in many different mm -hmm. ways. And that's where AI really shines. That's where I think it's best applied. Okay. So we have AI, and uh, it turns out that things behave really weird in high dimensions. So, you know, imagine uh, a piece of paper <clears throat> and you draw a dog on it doesn't matter how you rotate the dog. You can never turn a dog that's facing to the left into a dog that's facing to the right. If you do it, he'll be upside down. You know what I mean? Yeah. The only way to get him to face to the right is to spin him in the third dimension okay. by sort of pulling him off the paper and putting him back. So um, in high, you know, we have an intuition for this kind of stuff. We can imagine a piece of paper, you lift it, you turn it around, and then the dog is facing the other direction. In high dimensions, things become very hard to imagine. You know, if you have a three-dimensional shoe and you spin it in the fourth dimension, a left-footed shoe becomes a right-footed shoe. Okay, yeah, I, I see where we're going with this. I mean, I, I remember myself the first times I played around with uh, reduction of dimensionality, PCA analysis. I, I, I couldn't even imagine interpreting the, the results. So why do we think this is important? Why should anybody care about these things and how can we apply it? Well. Let's be uh, strict about what the mathematical conclusion here is. The conclusion is that in high dimensional space, everything is unexplored. So we tend to think about in regression, you know, this line that fits along a number of data points yeah. that you've mapped out. In high dimension, it's very hard to understand exactly how things are cut because it's hard to intuit it. And what happens is in high dimensional learning, that line or the equivalent of that line, your data points aren't along that line almost ever. For every dimension you add, the new points that you add are going to be somewhere that you haven't been before. So a lot of people think that AI is not really good at understanding new examples. It's only good at understanding examples that it's seen before. But the fact of the matter is, by virtue of it working in a really high dimensional space, AI is always working on samples that are really far away from what it's seen before. So now I have to stop you there for, for a second, because what we're saying or what you're saying basically is it is actually quite good at extrapolating, making conclusions on unseen data sets. Both mathematically and intuitively, you need to understand that AI is almost always extrapolating. 
That's all it does. But, but it seems like, from my point of view, it's a major leap from linear regression, which most data scientists today, I would say, are still using as kind of the, the Swiss arm in high for everything. So how do you go from linear regression to these type of insights? Where should you go? What should you look? And what should people out there trying to implement these things, what should they think about? I think the hardest part about AI is understanding how gracefully or non-gracefully it fails when it doesn't do what you expect it to do. And the funny thing is that AI tends to do what's reasonable. It, it's not random, obviously. And so the question is, how can we build an intuition for what's reasonable for an AI to understand or not understand? So I think uh, one, one tip that I give, there's obviously a lot of really technical stuff you can do to, to try and help an AI um, fail gracefully. But for decision makers that are trying to understand whether or not it's reasonable for an AI to solve a problem, uh, a good rule of thumb I'd say is if you were to give a human uh, infinite time to practice and learn, would it be reasonable for a human to find a pattern and be able to solve a problem? If a human can't even do it in principle, it's going to be very difficult right now to make an AI that can do it. Okay, I, I can see where you're coming from. So, I mean, that's at least the approach. Then, then I'm always at the point here. Is it worth it? Uh, I think one of the points here is, yeah, we can probably start looking into dimensionality, but then we need to find the, the right skill sets. We need to find people like yourself that, that understands this. You need to have the available data set, and then you need to have a way to actually acting on these things. Yeah. Would you say that the investment cost that goes into finding, building, uh, and creating all the prerequisites is worth it? Uh, or does that fully depend on the thing you're trying to solve? I'm giving my, my own answer away a little bit there. Well, uh, I think that the scoping of the problem is 80% of the work that determines the success of the project. I'd like to give one little example of a kind of uh, AI problem where you should be able to understand whether it's reasonable or not. Imagine you have a picture of a car and you want to classify what model and, and uh, year it is. Well, reasonably, a human provided that they know enough about cars, would be able to do that. Yeah. But if you ask that human, okay, now tell me uh, exactly how old the driver is and uh, uh, you know, what their gender is and what their favorite music type is, and you, know, you keep asking those kinds of questions, there's no human that could ever tell you what favorite kind of music the driver listens to. You know, they might make an educated guess, but reasonably it's not possible. And so why would we expect an AI to solve that kind of a problem? Yeah. So imagine you scope things that way. You would determine from the get-go that your AI project is set to fail if you make that kind of a scope ahead of time. So basically the questions you ask determine the output you get. Absolutely. Uh, and I think what I'm add on to answer my own question as well is I look at it at two axes. I mean, the, the speed and, and the accuracy. So take, for instance, you have millions of pictures, relatively complex that you need to classify. Uh, you can do it relatively easy with very novel techniques, but you get a less or not so good accuracy. But you're still going to reduce the time for actually manual labor with several years, tens or 20 or 30 years. Improving the technique will take you probably six to 12 months extra uh, just to get some extra results and you get an incremental uplift of just a few percentages. Yeah. Then you as a decision maker here needs to probably sit down your foot and say, we're not going to invest six to 12 months for you to improve this technique. You rather need to do something simple to get started uh, and then start investigating more if it's worth it. Yeah, for sure. There are diminishing gains. I think it's important to keep that in mind. Cool. But this is a super interesting topic and I know we have a bunch more to talk about. So, so let's, uh, let's move on. Yeah. So onwards and upwards towards the nest topic. Um, I think one of the hardest things I've ever encountered uh, is not actually the, the technical side. It, it is people. Finding good people to Tell build your team. <laughs> I know. So, so what's your experience with trying to find good people, Robert? Well, I sympathize with decision makers that aren't experts in AI because I struggle to determine in one hour or a couple of hours whether a person is qualified or not. So I can't imagine what non-AI experts go through trying to determine you know, how, how good a person is and how, how good they will support their organization. It is a talents market right now and many people are content where they are as well, which is a good thing. And that's I think what everybody should strive for. 
but us trying to expand or invest into this area it's super hard uh, where do you find them how should you position yourself uh, what are the kind of extra tests you should do around ai talent should you pay them when they're doing long text <laughs> tests etc uh, all of these things are, are super hard topics to deal with i get the sense that hiring for AI is different than hiring for, say, Java development or database development. It's not necessarily the same kind of things that determine if a person will be successful or not. You've hired many people yeah. in the couple of, past couple of years. What, what do you think makes them different from database developers or something? So they are problem solvers. I mean, in a sense, all working with different tools and technologies are problem solvers, but data scientists, and now we kind of limit ourselves into the data science where we can talk about other topics later on as well, but primarily they're trying to do all the different tools, technologies, and algorithms to find the optimal solution to create the best output. And how do you test for that? Today, many data scientists still get a lot of technical tests sent to them. So like, oh, well, what does this formula mean? And I, I've been guilty of that myself, and it's a good qualifier for junior people. But as a senior data scientist, you don't want to get sent something you, you're taught the first year at uni, right? Because you <laughs> presented a way beyond that. So you need to find different ways. What I did in the end was rather look for aptitude because my gut feeling was always like, if this person is really forward leaning, trying to solve problems and look for ways to actually accelerate, that's more important than if they've done a PhD in math, for instance. So the saying around hire for, for attitude and train for skills is, is quite a good way of finding good data scientists these days. Why do you think that is? I mean, I get the sense that um, there's more best practice in well-established traditional fields and in data science we're making it up as we go along so to speak is that fair or is that an exaggeration no it's it's totally fair because data science is an umbrella name for so many different things um, I mean, the first couple of hires I did, I mean, there were PhDs. Oh, I'm an expert in this uh, very high level regression techniques. I'm probably the best in the world. Like I'd see it was like, yeah, but I, I don't need uh, these type of tools and techniques. So data scientists today, they are not categorized and sorted into different uh, boxes. They're rather kind of saying, oh, I need a data scientist. And then they talk about a very large profession, which concludes everything from data analysts to mathematicians to, in some cases, engineers as well. Uh, so we need to be more clear and define on what we're trying to do with the data scientists. What role does experience play in this? Because there are people that will say, well, I've been doing data science since the 90s. And I, I guess in a sense they have been. But so, so how does that experience carry over then to the kinds of things that you want uh, an AI person to be or a data person to be doing nowadays? Hey, it's a super good question. And that's why I always talk about the T-shaped profile, right? I don't care if you have like 15 years of experience if you're just an I, which basically means you're an expert in one thing and say, oh, I've been doing data science. I've been doing the same type of, of statistics since the 90s. Yeah, we, we know statistics have been around for that. But if you haven't really expanded your toolbox, that's the key thing. Have you spent time actively developing your skills to grow in the area? Because even though the same basic tools and techniques are used today, you have a much bigger tool set today. So your mind and how you approach knowledge, that's what's important, not if you're the best in the world in one particular uh, technique. That person I'm gonna hire if there is a specific job involved with that technique and I need to optimize. And then I probably just prefer a, a consultant. Right. That, that reminds me, when I was uh, trying to figure out what to do after university, I was very uh, shocked to discover that I had the opportunity to work in Formula One because they were doing fluid dynamic simulations. And it hadn't occurred to me at all that there's somebody doing that kind of stuff. And I suppose if you had said, well, I know physics, so I can do fluid dynamic si simulations, they wouldn't hire you. You need to know the tool. You need to know the latest and greatest stuff. And I suppose the equivalent in AI is that, you know, yeah, sure, you do need to know the math. And there, there's like a prerequisites list. but. Um, I do think that people need to be keeping up with things. Are there any sort of telltale signs in your experience? What, what kind of people keep up with what's new in best practice and technology and that kind of thing? Like, what do you look for when you're talking with people? So 
I have some some qualifying questions, which actually isn't tool and technology yet. It's rather I ask people, do you have any questions? Mm. And that's usually a good indicator. If they say, no, I don't have any questions, then you know that they're not, they don't have a curious mind or they're super nervous. That's okay as well. You have to make that judgment. Uh, but if you ask like, do you have any questions? Some people just jump on that. Yeah, sure. How are you doing that? What is this? Oh, that. Have you tried this type? And then they just don't just ask questions. They give input as well. Yeah. Those people are usually the ones that have the, the knowledge or they have the capacity to bring in new knowledge. Yeah. And then, of course, you have to adopt it to your current situation. There isn't a one size fits all. But usually you can try to push them a little bit, try to give them a, a little bit of kind of, oh, but have you considered X, Y, and Z? Yeah, yeah, I have. So usually they have considered all the options when you present them with a problem. And if they've done that, then you know they're probably going to be very good at their job. And then I think that the question back to the people that are hiring, do you have enough problems for them to solve? Because once those people get started, it goes really fast. Yeah, and are you willing to sort of take in the input from these people? Yeah. They will unearth things that you probably haven't thought of before. Exactly, so it's broken down into kind of finding good talent, but also defining what you need. Yeah. You can hire extremely talented individuals by following that recipe, but that individual might not be the right person for the job you're trying to get done. Sometimes you actually just need a data analyst or a statistician or somebody that knows us know the, the job to be done before you try to hire talented people. That's right. You know what, I think we can revisit this topic quite a couple of times. Oh, definitely. I can speak about this forever and ever. We can talk about technical screenings and talk about setups and everything. But let's, uh, let's jump on to the next topic. All right. So, continuing our, our dialogue. Uh, what are we going to talk about now, Rob? I would like to talk about adversarial examples. Okay. That sounds uh, really cool. Can you explain to, to our viewers and listeners what, what's adversarial? This is a bit of a philosophy concept because there's no technical definition of adversarial, con uh, adversarial examples. But you might have seen examples where AI you know, classifies an image as one thing, but it's very obviously another thing. Whoa, whoa. So this sounds like when AI makes mistakes. Basically, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this can be a really interesting discussion. So what pops into your mind then immediately when AI makes mistake or adversarial content? I think it's very charming because one of the first examples I saw of it was a scuba diver that had taken a picture of a shark from underneath, right? So the background is blue and the shark is, you know, just floating in the air and the AI thought it was an airplane. And I thought, that's funny. It does look like an airplane. I, I've seen the same things. I even use it in some of my presentations. Like you show a picture of a, a parrot and then kind of a guacamole and it's like, hey, do you think AI can, can make that? That's a picture? good point. Yeah. Well, I mean, <clears throat> the example I gave was something that a child might make, the kind of mistake. Oh, that's an airplane. No, it's not. It's a shark. But what yeah. you gave here is a targeted attack yeah. where a person on purpose fools an AI. And both of them are adversarial examples. And another example then would be, what if there is a face recognition? So say we are in a state and want to have full control over its citizens, films everything, but you just print out a mask of somebody else that's not wanted. And you go around with that mask and you're yeah. fooling the AI. Yeah, that's totally possible. There's actually people that wear glasses that have special pixels on them that fool AI on purpose. It's in, you don't even have to have a mask. It's enough to have a t-shirt with some weird pixels on it and it can fool certain models if you know what model is running. Yeah. And I think when we utilize AI these days, I mean, it's all for some sort of improvement or some sort of innovation or something new. What really scares me is when you don't have control over the AI and everybody's going to go to this example, that Microsoft chatbot, right? Right. Hey. <laughs> the, the racist prick of yeah, our time. Yeah. Basically just learning what everybody else is doing online. Yeah. But what is our point of view on that? What's your point of view on that? I think there's a really nice upside to AI in general, and that is that they're retrainable and we can constantly improve them. So there might be some bigoted person making decisions at a bank or some other place uh, that affects people's lives. And it's very hard to uh, sometimes get them in trouble or <laughs> retrain them. Whereas an AI is easy to retrain. 
Yeah, it's, it's harder to retrain people. I mean, what we do when we hire people and talk to people is we have the no assholes rule, I would say. We don't hire assholes. Yeah. Uh, that's not as easy uh, on AI because it trained from a lot of different samples. It's hard to get unbiased data. Right. Uh, but I think it's more and more important to introduce some sort of safety measurements, uh, both on the AI side mathematically, but also from a control side, people actually managing and making sure these decisions doesn't go haywire. I think there's one challenge. From a technical perspective, uh, it's very difficult to decide what is a bad prediction and what is a good prediction. Yes, and this really baffles my mind because the, the jobs I've done is all about being business optimization, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's also something called business strategy on top of that. Let, let's not go into what that is, but it, it's simpler than explaining AI. But I would say the hardcore of your decision making should be your AI algorithm. It should be governed by your business strategy and your business rule which basically says, oh, I want to give this offer to somebody. Well, that's not our target group. That's not aligned with our strategy. So no, even though the AI says yes, there is a safety measure around it. And I also think that that should go into, um, goes into messaging from AI. Before anything goes out, it goes through like a filter of business rules, policies, etc., to align uh, the AI, if it's a chatbot, if it's a recommendation or anything else, to make sure that the output is really aligned with what you want to achieve as a business. It's not the perfect world, but at least it puts some control over the things that you're putting out in the wild, if that's what you want to do with AI. For sure. I think what you're saying is that uh, this is a business process. Because from a technical perspective, it's not possible to guarantee that adversarial examples don't exist. I think for the viewers, it's interesting to know, a lot of people might think that these examples of uh, you know, AI making mistakes, that that's something specific to deep learning or to AI. But you have adversarial examples even in linear regression. And the problem is that it's, you, it's not a matter of that AI is a black box both at a distribution level and at a symbolic level, you will never be able to get rid of these weird examples of a, the AI making mistakes. And so it becomes a process where you're trying to constantly figure out, is this the kind of output that we want? Is this in line with our business objectives? Is this the kind of risk that we're willing to take? Obviously, I think it's kind of neat. I have to give uh, credit to Microsoft for taking the risk of putting Tay out there, right? Because <laughs> it was a catastrophe, yeah. but props to them for trying, for going for it and not just, you know, being scared and saying, oh, but what if something bad happens? Because they did learn a lot from it. I think we all learn a lot from it. I mean, I use it as examples, use example constantly on not how to do things. So it creates awareness. So I mean, hat off to Microsoft being able to do something like that. We all know how hard it is to get a decision or approval like that in a large organization. So. How can you determine how uh, risk averse to be? In other words, you know, when you're trying to determine if it's time to deploy an AI solution that yeah. you're pretty sure it will make mistakes, when is the right time? It's like one of my customer once said, it's we're not in healthcare, we're not in the business of saving lives, right? Uh, your tolerance of accepting errors and mistakes probably is higher in businesses that are moving fast, right? Like fast fashion, fast food, things that are entertainment, that kind of, okay, we can course direct. Okay, we made a mistake, let's on to the next thing. But if you're on the other hand, in a regulated industry, you're doing finance, uh, you don't want to give mortgages to on the wrong grounds, right? Uh, you don't want to prescribe uh, medicine on the wrong decisions, uh, and you definitely don't want AI to take decisions which can be life or death and have an error rate of 10%. Right. So I think it all boils down to your risk appetite and your potential to course direct when something goes wrong. That's something we should talk about in another episode, the rate of change in certain industries and how AI is driving that. Telco, for example, probably a pretty traditional industry. What effect is AI having on it right now? Interesting topic, but let's move on to the next. Let's move on. Errol, you told me you wanted to talk about AI architecture, which is fun. I have an idea about AI architecture and I imagine it's super technical, but I have a feeling that that's not exactly what you meant, or perhaps it is. What do you mean by AI architecture? So, 
let's start with uh, what's hot right now. I mean, people are still talking about MLOps and I started looking into these topics around like 2017 uh, after being a, a data scientist for, for quite a while. And I was so frustrated uh, when I was building global solutions and I was like, this doesn't work. Why can't I get the data? Why isn't the technology working? Why aren't the pieces really fitting together? I've done this great thing. How do I go to production? Mm. I was obsessed. Uh, and then uh, um, uh, a very cool tech leader uh, in the company I was working for is like, oh, look at this. We call it analytics ops. It's like DevOps, but for machine learning and AI, let's brand it as analytics ops. And then I, of course, got obsessed with that because the purpose of that was to take insight to production. Right. And in order for you to do that, you need to fully understand how you do things in different steps. So you need to break it down, you need to look at the different pieces, and then you need to say, okay, how do I use it and how do I follow up? And then when I grow up a little bit more, I realize, well, what we're talking about here basically is architectural architecture, because there are different architectural patterns. Different architectural patterns makes it easier for us to understand the totality of the AI solutions that we're building. So that's why I want to make a kind of a big push more towards architectural patterns for going to production with AI. So how do we do deep learning? How do we do follow up? I mean, we start seeing more and more topics popping up on the market. We're trying to do MLOps. But still, it isn't really fully sold and you require different architectures for different things you're implementing, like a chatbot requires one type of architecture, uh, implementation of neural network requires one architecture, pure linear regression requires one type of architecture. And it's not until we start establishing these best practices, follow up on these things and teach them that we can fully say we have developed a mature area within AI and technology. Let's split this up. So there's like uh, various degrees of granularity of architecture that we could be talking about. We could be talking about everything from the actual neural network models architecture to the environment in which it's deployed to the, you know, the work uh, process that you could be employing where, you, you know, you maybe you might be inspired by software development operations best practices. Which one of these, or where do you think decision makers need to start skilling themselves up in to be able to make, you know, put AI into production? So if you understand processes and process modeling, uh, which is kind of at the core of understanding architecture, uh, as a business leader, you don't need to be like on an L5 level, which is like core core, what happens in the, these different steps, what's the pure architecture of a neural network, you don't have to be there. And you'd never have to be skilled in those unless you actually want to be a developer at those topics. However, at the business leader, you need to be at the highest level. You need to at least understand the concept of it. I mean, you can break it down into two main topics, which what I did early on. One is developing and then the another one is deploying. And how does they impact everything from the technical choices that your CTO, CIO needs to make or your data science team? And how does deployment also affect those things? So that's the level you as a business uh, developer or no business leader should be at in order to make at least informed decisions and having the right dialogue with your, your development teams. So can you give an example of like one kind of AI architecture tidbit that a business decision maker would be you know more well off by knowing well a good architectural pattern is the standard one in the beginning most deployments were done you build deploy at once that was like a big flow mm -hmm. a good understanding would be data scientists usually have an iterative process that iterative process is like sitting in a notebook and then they're doing iterations and optimizing when they're done, they're freezing the model and that model is lift in to be done used for inference. That type of architectural pattern is good to understand because it has implications of how much data do you need to have in storage, retention periods, what type of tools and technology like a Jupyter notebook do they need to have. So you can also then get a better understanding. Was that what you're looking for or were I totally off? No, no, that's right. And I guess the question is like, um, what kinds of uh, skill sets do the, these decision makers need to skill themselves up on in order to be able to um, 
determine if they're headed in the right direction because they're not going to be making the architectural choices themselves but they do need to be inspired and, and be able to gauge whether they're headed in the right direction or not yeah so what i usually do when i kind of am airlifted into a situation and i know nothing about the architecture and i can just make assumption is i always break it down into three questions uh, it's why why and why because that's the only thing you need to know as a business leader, right? When you are talking to your development team, you need to say, oh, I need GPUs. Why? Oh, I need to do that. Okay. Why? Oh, because then it will go faster. Okay. Then you got the answer to the question. Uh, and then, of course, then you need to weigh these options together. So you probably just need to upskill in critical thinking and also understand business model processes. This reminds me very much of this sort of targeted question type thing where you don't know anything about a topic, but if you just keep asking why, you will get to the root of matters. That's exactly it. And that's the tool and technique I usually do when I don't know anything, but, but I want to solve a problem because usually people that you are questioning or that has the answers, they will give it to you if you just keep asking questions like why. What's a bad answer? I imagine that a bad answer would be because somebody else is doing it this way. Uh, I mean, yeah, that's pretty much it. And it happens quite often. And people just, oh, well, they are doing it. Um, so people have a tendency of being relatively lazy as well. And that's what you as a leader have to kind of work against. There's nothing wrong with being lazy if it's efficient. But if you're just lazy because you're doing what you've always done, then you should be worried as a, a business leader. So questioning these type of architectures, we're still early days in these type of architectures. So it's better to question and scrutinize than to take things for granted, because I can guarantee you the majority of people building AI solutions are making things up as they go along. I think that's okay. Yeah, I think that's okay as well. And I think the only thing from a business perspective is that you, your, your objective should be to make sure that they make things up that are the best ones. But then the question is, you know, in the old days, you would buy a data warehouse that was intended to last a decade. Yeah. How long should these things last? Or not that they can't last a long time, but how long should you plan for them to last at least? So a bit of correction there. They weren't built to last a decade, probably like yeah. a long, many, long decades. Decades. many decades. And I've seen them. Um, that's a super good question. It's actually a topic for uh, a long episode as well. But I mean, they shouldn't expect them to last long at all because things are moving so fast. So when you're doing architecture, you need to follow technology best practices, which is basically everything you do should be relatively modular. Everything you do should have uh, stateless applications. It should be cloud first, if you can do cloud first. It should follow this like, um, things so it's easy for you to tear things up and put them out change pieces when best practices are established don't buy the best platform buy the best component in an ecosystem instead so you can change if something better comes along because the only thing we can be secure on uh, secure on in technology and ai is that things are evolving and progressing every single day so plan for that things coming tomorrow will be so much better than what you have today I'm looking forward to digging into this a bit more because I think it's an unpopular opinion. And even people that are really progressive, when I tell them, you know, you should plan for having to reinvent yourself once a year, they're like, oh man, that's way too much. You can't, can't, it can't go that fast. That's the way things are. You're going to have to like it. Yeah. It, it, there's a good saying when the rate of change on the outside is faster than the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. And that's basically it. If you invest in a tool and technology and think this is going to last a decade, two decades, you're going to be a dinosaur in five years if you don't invest or architect solutions that are uh, easy to exchange you're locking yourself into a dungeon that you will never be able to get out of and then to your point the only thing that can save you is a good architectural pattern that allows you to reinvent yourself exactly that's that's why i wanted to talk about it but <laughs> let's keep digging into that in other uh, episodes all right all right, so a topic I wanted to talk to you about is trusting AI. I think that comes up in a lot of scenarios and there's different ways to think about the topic. And the reason I wanted to talk about it was because I saw an article that I thought was very neat. A recently published paper on Sci Archive, which is archive for <laughs> psychologists perhaps. In any case, the article was about the fact that they had discovered that 
people tend to trust charts, you know, data about COVID or whatnot, more if the chart was beautiful, if it had a nice color palette, if it had nice lines and everything. So the more beautiful the chart is, the more compelling it is. And I thought that was an interesting thing that determined the trustworthiness of the data. And so in contrast with AI here, my question to you, Errol, is in your experience, how much does the technical performance of the AI actually correlate with whether it's trustworthy or not? Well, we talk about trusting AI. I have a hard time trusting people to, to start with, but that's, that's another that's topic for another, another day. Uh, but I think it doesn't matter how good it is. You have to build the trust, right? So I've been a part of deploying and rolling out large forecasts for, for global organizations. And you always account or encounter the type of people is like, no, 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 I trust my gut feeling in this. The, the AI doesn't know this better than I do. So you have to show them. You have to kind of set up the test. You have to build trust and you have to make sure that they understand that this is amplifying the human race in a sense. That was very large and bombastic, but it's basically what it's doing. You're improving uh, the decision making. You're able to reach the long tail solutions. Trust is not something that's there by default. It's something you have to earn. It, the same thing goes for people back to my trust issues. And the same thing goes for AI and technology in general. What's the right approach? Because um, with people, you know, if you're hiring somebody, it's very hard to test them for yeah. a long time before you hire them. And it's the same with AI. I think a lot of people are thinking we need to do tests on the AI to make sure we trust it before we deploy it. Like how reasonable is that? I think it's super reasonable. I always say, rather than focusing on building AI, you should have a testing framework in place. Because the question you should always ask yourself when you're looking into AI, is it AI I need or is it rules I need? Regardless, that's not the discussion at hand. But what you need to do is have a testing framework. You need to be able to do like canary deployments, so check in, in shadow production. You need to do multivariate testing or at the least A-B testing of the results getting out there. And you need to have sort of a challenger approach. So humans, what are they able to do? AI, how are they able to support and, and implement the decision making at scale? Uh, getting to a place where we're even automating decision making is a process. You can try to do it, uh, but the majority of those initiatives will most likely fail due to lack of trust in the decision-making process. Yeah. I think it might be worth distinguishing between the trust that you as a deployer have in the performance of the model and the acceptance by the customer. Yes. So it's very hard to trust a model to be liked or accepted by a customer. So. There seems to be sort of a wall that you hit where, you know, you can test the model all you want and make sure that it behaves exactly the way you've planned for it to behave. Yeah. But that doesn't mean the customer will like it or that it will have the effect that you had intended, you know, the return on investment or whatever. Exactly. And I think it all boils down to the, the saying that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So people also need to kind of have that type of mindset and expectation. And then back to the, the way we implement the decision-making, multivariate setups, testing frameworks, because in my opinion, we don't do AI for the sake of AI. So people trusting the, the AI, they need to understand that the results they're getting is just as good as the person that defined a model and what we're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. So trust in this sense is much more about acceptance of the process acceptance of we don't know everything everything is changing ai is helping us to make sense of the large amount of data that is out there but we complement it with human intuition and uh, other aspects to make sure we make the optimal decisions in every single interaction that's a great point accepting the process i'm thinking about language models and some people give the impression that you know, if you understand the inner workings of the language model, that will lead to ultimate trust. But, you know, when a customer is going through a process with a chat bot, for example, that process doesn't necessarily, as a process, have much to do with, you know, the exact answers. Because the, the experience of interacting with your company through a chat bot is in part the language model, 
but also in part a user experience of a process and how you want to be perceived as a company and that kind of thing. Exactly. Um, it, it is hard and AI is here to stay, but we don't have to see it. We have to understand it, right? And we will use it because AI is still quite dumb. We're not talking about general AI, we're talking about narrow AI still. So I think the education of society uh, needs to be there, but we also need to implement a better feedback culture, right? Feedback, that's awesome. Like, what would you say to companies that are thinking about deploying a language model but are worried that they can't trust it to do a good job? Transparency. I mean, if that's the way forward and you're unsecure, build in a feedback optimist, uh, opt, um, optimization immediately in the chatbot and make sure that your team focuses more on tracking the process. Of course, do what you can to minimize errors in the beginning, but I mean, when you're chatting to a bot, you should always be able to give feedback. It pops up, right? Most of the time it's like, hey, can I help you with something? And you write something, oh, I didn't understand that. Can you please uh, type it another way? No? Okay, oh, sorry, I can't do that. Please call customer service you should have a feedback option like, did this work for you? Or how can we improve? And the most single indicator if this is good or not is the feedback from your customers. I think that's a great point about data culture in a company where a lot of companies sort of sit on these pools of data and they're like, what can we do with this? When the fact of the matter is they can actually be proactive and start instrumenting things to collect more data and understand things better. You know, when you're designing things for AI, what can we pull in that would be useful? Yeah. It's, um, it's a brave new world out there. And I think building trust in technology is the key here. We've always had this problem. We've always struggled with new, new innovations, building trust. I mean, in the beginning of the railroads, people didn't think man should go faster than 40 kilometers per hour. Today, <laughs> we say that's nonsense. Uh, I mean, you can imagine how people reacted to the, the flight when it came. We are building trust and we're educating the world. Trust isn't per default, trust is earned. Good point. Well, that was a great chat. I, I hope you liked it as well. Uh, we're gonna do this on a, a weekly basis, but we need topics. So if you have something that you want us to discuss or should pay attention to, just drop us a line, we're easy to find online. Send us a message anywhere. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you soon.